Code Newbie is a community of programmers and people learning to code. There are so many people learning about software today, and Code Newbie gives them a place to hang out, to socialize, and become comfortable with the world of software. Code Newbie also has an excellent podcast, and if you like Software Engineering Daily, you should check it out. Saran Yitbarak is my guest today. She is the creator of Code Newbie, and she's the host of the Code Newbie podcast. In this episode of Software Engineering Daily, Saran sits down to talk about learning to code after she had already had several careers. Um, her careers have spanned biology, public radio, marketing, uh, all kinds of things. She's really a polymath. If you're a fan of Software Engineering Daily, we want to know how to improve. Please take five minutes to fill out our listener survey. There is a link to the survey in our newsletter and on our website. We would love to know what you think, what you want to hear more of, and what you want to hear less of. We read all of the feedback that we get, so please fill out the survey and help us build the best software podcast for you. After a quick word from our sponsor, we will get to this episode, Code Newbie with Saran Yitbarak. There are hundreds of tools for looking at user data. Google Analytics, Optimizely, Mixpanel, Customer.io, all of these tools can be useful for figuring out how users are engaging with a product. Unfortunately, many of these tools require you to write domain-specific code in order to gather the data and set up your integrations. What if I told you that there is a product for writing code only once, a single API, a tool for unifying your data and performing analytics on any platform, from Marketo to MailChimp. Segment is that product. Segment simplifies your analytics so that you can collect customer data with one API and send it to any of hundreds of tools for analytics, marketing, and data warehousing. With Segment, a developer can satisfy all the stakeholders at once, from the data-driven account manager to the app-happy marketer to the data scientist who needs a data warehouse with a clean schema. Thanks to Segment, your CEO will fall in love with your newly efficient integrations with tools like Zendesk, Intercom, and AppNexus. I'm falling in love with Segment just talking about it. Thanks to Segment for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. If you are listening to Software Engineering Daily and you have not tried Segment, give it a shot at segment.com and tweet at Segment to let them know you heard about the product on Software Engineering Daily. We wouldn't be doing this show without the sponsors. So thanks again to Segment for sponsoring this show. Now let's get on with this episode. Saran Yudbarak is the host of the Code Newbie podcast, a show about programming and learning to code. Saran, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me. When did you decide to become a software engineer? Sure. So I think it was maybe four, almost five years ago at this point where I was working for a bunch of different startups. And I worked for startups doing everything that was not technical. So I've done some business development, some sales, some marketing, a bunch of you know random things. And what I really wanted to do was impact the product. And I really wanted to affect the product that we worked on. And I couldn't because I wasn't technical and I didn't know how to code. And I felt like I just kept hitting this wall for a number of years where I couldn't be you know, the person I wanted to be. And so finally, out of frustration at my last startup job, I said, screw this. I'm going to learn to code. I quit my job. Um, and that was the, the beginning of the journey. What were your first steps to learning how to code once you had decided that you wanted to be a programmer? So when I first learned to code, um, I actually think I had a much easier time then than I would if I tried to learn to code now because the resources were just, there were just so much, so many less resources back then, which made it a little bit easier. Um, but one of the things I did was figure out what it was that I wanted to learn. I didn't know what a language was. I didn't know what a framework was. I didn't really know enough about the structure or the building blocks or, you know, what that world was even made of to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this. So I spent a couple of weeks maybe doing just a lot of research, reading a lot of Quora posts, you know, asking the question, I want to learn to code. Where do I start over and over and over again until I finally made a decision? So just that was step one. Um, and then step two was figuring out, okay, I wanted to learn Ruby. 
if I want to learn Ruby, then who do I learn it from? What steps do I take? And how do I know when I'm done learning? And that was also a pretty hard question to answer. Um, but that was the, the second thing that I did. And so as time has gone on, you've eventually started the Code Newbie podcast, and we'll get into that. So you've been talking to people a lot about the difficulties of learning to code, the barriers to learning to code, and how to succeed in that environment. So juxtaposing that knowledge that you've learned through the Code Newbie podcast with your own personal experience learning to code, what are the biggest barriers to people learning to code? Sure, there's a lot of them. I think one of the biggest ones is figuring out what to learn, how to learn it, and when to know when you're done. One of the biggest trends I see in our community is uh, people dabbling. You know, they'll try JavaScript for a little bit and then move on to Python. Then, you know, within Python, they'll do a little bit of Django then switch to Flask. And there's just like no focus in on one thing. And I've heard so many stories of people saying, I tried a bunch of things for the last four months and I'm not that much better off. I'm not that much closer to getting a job, you know, than I was four months ago. And that dabbling issue has been absolutely huge. I was really lucky. I'm not a dabbler. I'm not that type of person. I like to pick a thing and dive deep and really focus on it. And I think that ended up serving me well. Um, But the dabbling is a huge, huge one. The second really big issue is just the money. You know, a lot of boot camps cost, you know, a, a good amount of money. They cost thousands of dollars. And now I think there are more payment plans than there were a couple years ago. There's, you know, loans you can take. There's, you know, pay at the end of the program when you get a job. Like there's different ways that they're trying to make it more affordable, but just the price tag of a solid foundation in code compared to, um, you know, what it's like when you're self-taught, that, that financial aspect is also a big issue in our community. How did you come upon the idea to start the Code Newbie podcast? Sure. So before the podcast, we'd been doing the Twitter chat for almost a year. And the Twitter chat is awesome. It's Wednesday nights. It's one hour, 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we just tweet different questions each week, trying to really get people to talk to each other. It's just an excuse to connect people. And it was great because it, it succeeded. You know, people meet all the time during that one hour and build relationships that they you know wouldn't have had without the chat. But what didn't happen is we didn't get a chance to dive deep, right? We couldn't like really get into someone's story. We couldn't really get into someone's journey. And I thought that would be a really important aspect, a really important thing for the community to have. And I know that a lot of other Twitter chats will use the Twitter chat format as an interview format where they'll have a guest on and they'll tweet them questions, which honestly, I'm not a big fan of. I don't feel like Twitter is a really good format for interviewing. It's, you know, 140 characters. So There's I thought, no okay, voice inflection. There's exactly. What is an interview without voice inflection? Um, and so I thought, okay, well, what's a better medium, right? Is it blog posts? Is it video? Is it podcasts? And before, you know, all the tech stuff, I used to work at NPR. I wanted to be a journalist. And so I thought audio, audio is a really good format. Let's try a podcast. Um, I'm super curious about the NPR stuff and I'll certainly ask you about that later on. But, um, Tell me about the Code Newbie community, because you've obviously been fostering this vibrant, amazing community. What What is the constitution of this community? Like, give me some kind of sense of the demographic and the, the give me the story of the prototypical Code Newbie person. Sure. So our community is international. I actually went to speak uh, at RubyConf Australia last week. And when I was there, uh, I took an Uber and my Uber driver was telling me about how he teaches Python. And my husband who's in the car with me said, um, yeah, you know, if you heard of this thing called Code Newbie, you know, trying to, you know, get more people to know about it. And he's like, Code Newbie. Oh, yeah, thing is no awesome. Way. I'm awesome. so serious. It was great. It was great. Uh, and even at the conference, you know, so many of the locals had already heard about it when I mentioned it. And they were really excited about the podcast and telling me stories. And so um, that was just huge. I had no idea we had people in Australia who already <laughs> knew about it. Um, so yeah, so we're definitely international. Uh, we are mostly career changers. We're a little bit older. We're people who found out about the whole coding thing a little bit later in life. Uh, most of us have some professional experience before getting into it. We have a good number of families and parents. Uh, we've had a couple of Twitter chats dedicated to family-oriented things. You know, how do you get your kids into code if you want to do that? Um, you know, how do you find support within your family as you start this new thing? Um, so we have a good number of families, but we also have a good percentage 
percentage of people who are more senior developers who are part of the community just to help out. And those people are amazing and they're so helpful. Uh, We have a pretty vibrant Slack community. I think we're almost at 3,000 members and we have people on there all the time who just, you know, wait for uh, a help call and they're right there giving answers and debugging with the community. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. This The psychological barriers, like I like that you touched on the, the idea that you sometimes have to f- convince your family that yes. this is a worthwhile pursuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I remember having to do this in college literally every semester. Uh, I'd be like, yeah, so I'm really enjoying this computer science stuff. And one of my parents would be like, so are you sure you can get a job with this? And I'd be like, yeah, like, you know how you're on your computer all the time? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm learning to, like, do that stuff, like, make that <laughs> stuff. And they're like, yeah, but are you sure you can get a job? Uh, okay. So, uh, anyway, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, there are a lot of people who are learning to code quote unquote late in the game. Uh, and you know, I, I learned, I think around 20, uh, I was age 20. I started, started learning and I obviously had the, the fear of missing out that everybody who starts later than like 12 years old has, they're like, Oh my gosh, why have, why did I have to wait this long? And how, (laughs) how will I ever catch up to all the people that started when they were 12 years old? What are the advantages to starting to learn to code later than the average person or later than the prototypical like 12 year old natural born programmer? That is such a good question. Um, I think there's two advantages. One, being able to appreciate it, you know, at that level, like our community is so excited, so, so passionate because this world is incredibly new to them. They just, you know, for most of their lives, they have treated technology as just consumers, right? They're the ones who receive the product and play with it. And this idea that they could open up the magic box and play around and create is just an incredibly new phenomenon. And so when we talk about, you know, getting employed and getting a job, our people are super passionate and super excited. They'll stay late. This is totally new and exciting to them. So I think that's a huge uh, advantage to starting it a little bit later. And the second one is that because a lot of our community came from different professions, um, they have a bunch of other skills. They're incredibly social. They're very good teachers. They love the community. They, you know, a lot of them come from more customer service type roles, whether that means sales or waiting tables or whatever that is. So they get the empathy part, right? That we always talk about in the tech community, how we need to be more empathetic. We need to be able to relate to the user. And, you know, there is a customer service component to being a good software developer. And so they have that already. They have those skills. They can speak to it. And so there's advantages in both experience and also just in the newness of coding is a huge thing for them. So these people that are making some kind of career change into coding, how do they typically work coding into their career transition? Do they do they continue on with their present job and learn to code at the same time? Or do they quit their job and then just go full force into coding? Or what typically happens where people decide, okay, I need to make a career transition? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, People do it however way they need to. One of my early guests, Brian Douglas, uh, he was on episode two of the Code Newbie podcast. He was working full time. He, I think he just had a kid around the time where he decided he wanted to learn to code. And so when he got home, he would code from like eight to midnight. Then he'd wake up at 4 a.m. and code from 4 a.m. until he got to work. During lunchtime at work, he would have these online study groups so he could learn to code. So he used every single hour that he possibly could, given that he had a full-time job and given that he had a family to take care of. So we've heard a lot of stories of people like that just squeezing in any hours they can. Um, A good number of people with the support of their family end up taking a little bit of time off and saying, you know, I'm going to take a couple months, which is, you know, what I ended up doing, uh, to learn to code. And hopefully at the end of this short period, I'll be able to get a job. And that takes a lot of, you know, financial stability. It takes family input and family support. Um, But I'd say most people are working at least part-time while also learning to code and hoping slowly over time to get enough skills and get enough experience to finally make that leap. In terms of your own career transitions, you started off pursuing medicine, and I had a stint of pursuing the pre-med field myself. 
what actually no i think i heard you say in in an in an interview i think this was with the the scott hanselman interview where you said um you know that you had an experience where you just realized you didn't really want to spend your life like no why don't you just explain to me what was, <laughs> what was it that made you switch from from pursuing medicine to other pursuits yeah, sure. So when I was pre-med, I was pre-med until basically my senior year. I, I finished the whole track. I was in the process of studying for the MCATs. And for me, what did it is that I finally shadowed a doctor. I shadowed a cardiologist. I think he was a cardiac surgeon. And I scrubbed in. And it was really awesome. I got to see them like fix a pacemaker and like cut this guy's chest open. You know, it, was, it was incredible to watch. But what I learned about that experience is that I was interested in the science. I was interested in the how things worked part of medicine. Um, I, you know, I loved organic chemistry and biochemistry and you know physiology and those topics and kind of figuring out what's the problem, what's the solution, how did this end up being this way? And the aspect of medicine, which is the most important one, which is saving people's lives, that part wasn't quite as interesting. And I learned that after shadowing this doctor for um, a couple of times. And so I thought, okay, if I don't want to save people's lives, I probably shouldn't be a doctor. What else do I do? And how does the practice of medicine compare to that of software engineering? <sighs> well, I haven't been a doctor yet, so I'm not really sure. Um, I can say, though, that my experience being pre-med and just, you know, how incredibly, incredibly hard I had to work while I was, you know, pre-med has definitely helped prepare me to learn to code. Um, a lot of, so right now I run, um, I run a, a program at Microsoft called Tech Jobs Academy, and it's a four-month technical training program uh, teaching people in-demand technical skills. It's not programming, it's more cloud server administration, IT type of stuff. But one of the big things that I see with our current cohort is the ability to study and to kind of buckle down and focus and find the right processes to absorb a lot of very strange, foreign, intimidating information in a very short amount of time. Um, and so when I was pre-med and I had to you know, read all these chemical reactions and understand what was going on and read about all these you know, big words I'd never seen before and just how incredibly technical that information was you know, in a different sense and having to come up with strategies and ways to quickly understand, absorb, and do well in the exams, that skill has translated very, very well when I'm learning about, you know, Ruby and frameworks and gems and all kinds of things that was so foreign to me when I first started. You know, there is this uh, attitude of the, uh, well, in, at least in the pre-med uh, training that I got the sense that it was this very mechanistic process where you you learn almost like a flow chart of how to do things. Um, and I feel like that is something that contrasts uh, somewhat sharply with software engineering, where there's there's a little more creativity and and latitude in in how you can do things. And I wonder if maybe that's uh, something that the medical process could learn from software engineering. Do you think that's that's unfair to say? So I remember taking this one class. I think it was called Mammalian Physiology, and up and I think it was my senior year. And up until that point. <clears throat> I felt like everything I learned about medicine was very black and white. Like you said, it was flowcharts, it was memorization, you know, I used a ton of flashcards, it was, if this happens, it's this, and if this happens, it's this other thing, and that was it. And when I took, I think it was the first exam, and we did, uh, the first exam was on cardiology, and we had to look at, uh, what are they called, EKG charts, and all of a sudden, it wasn't black and white anymore, mm. because the EKG charts we were looking at were from real patients, and they did not map exactly to my textbook, you know, you know, beautiful charts that were so clear with the point and the loop. You know, it, it didn't match up quite right. It took right. some interpretation. It took some interpretation, right. And there were so many, and, and that was the first exam where I said, huh, there is a little bit of art to this because it's not going to be as picture perfect. It's not going to be as clear cut. You still have to use your experience and your gut and your feel to kind of figure out what makes sense. I think there's still a limit to that at the end of the day. You know, you have to diagnose a patient and, you know, kind of pick one way to do things. Um, but I do think there's more creativity in medicine, given, of course, that I'm not actually a doctor. Um, but I think there's more creativity in medicine than I initially thought there was. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about podcasting and 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 I guess starting with your, your career 
at NPR. You spent some time at NPR. How well does NPR understand what is going on in the world of technology? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, so when I was there, I worked on a show called Tell Me More with Michelle Martin. And what we did was definitely not a focus on technology. Um, it was more, well, it was just, you know, kind of general news. Um, I think I remember pitching a story on Bitcoin that I think I had to do a little bit of convincing to do because like no one could understand the relevance <laughs> of Bitcoin. Um, and at that point, I didn't really understand it either. I just knew it was a thing that we should cover. Um, and, uh, that, and that led to more on like virtual currency and, um, this whole like virtual economy of people buying for, you know, digital art for, you know, tons of money, that kind of thing. And it ended up being a really interesting piece. Um, but I can say that now NPR is definitely taking digital a lot more seriously at the very least on their tech side. Um, they've done a lot of work, a lot of open source work on building digital tools for journalists and, um, you know, working in that area. And they've been very, very vocal about it. They have a really great uh, like tech blog for their internal team. Um, I don't know how much that influence has carried over to covering stories on technology, but I know that like podcasting is something they're taking a lot more seriously and really building up their tech arsenal is something they've been doing over the years. You know, I think it's, it's such a challenge for some of these media organizations to report on highly technical topics. Like, I think Bitcoin is a perfect example because it's so hard to get it right, like what you're actually reporting on. And I mean, I saw a documentary just last week about Silk Road, and in it, they spent like 15 <laughs> minutes talking about Bitcoin. And the sense that they talked about was like, here is a way that you can send money electronically. And oh. and that was it. And I was like, you didn't even <laughs> mention the term distributed ledger. Like that, like you did, didn't even get it. And but that's totally understandable because like how would you how would you even be able to grapple with that concept as a, a an old media reporter doing yeah you know, with only, you know, so much time to work on a story like that? So what did you learn at NPR that you have applied to podcasting? Yeah, great question. Um, for me, it is to rely on the guests. So exactly the example you gave, I try not to be the person of knowledge on my show. I try to let the guests be the star and I take a back seat and I let them you know, kind of own their knowledge and own their expertise and own their own story. And that's been a huge, you know, part of the success of our show when I was at NPR as well. You know, we did a lot of research, I think right before the interviews, I would send, um, I would send our host, Michelle Martin, a big stack of research I'd done with pre-interview notes and, you know, and data and all this stuff. And she would somehow magically read through all of it. And I know this because in the interview, she would randomly pull facts that I know were like in the middle of the stack. And I have no idea how she remembered that, you know, that one data point just to have that question in. Um, but yeah, what I learned was it's important for the host to have some contacts and background information so they can have an intelligent conversation, but to not make it about me, the host, knowing all the answers and being the expert of the show, but really taking a step back and letting the guest take that conversation wherever it goes um, and, and letting them be the star. Right. Your company has important projects that need to get done. The iOS app needs to be rewritten for Android. The database needs to be migrated. Your continuous deployment system needs to be built. The website needs a complete redesign, but you don't have enough software engineers and designers to get all this work done. TopTal is here to save you. TopTal gives you exclusive access to the top 3% of freelance talent. Software engineers and designers, from Python to PHP, TopTal has the freelance talent you need to get your projects finished on time with top quality. In the past, we had to worry about flaky freelancers with poor communication skills, unreliable internet connections, subpar technical skills, and so on. TopTal screens for these kinds of things and only works with seasoned professionals with tremendous problem-solving skills, personality, and drive. Here's how it works. TopTal's internal team of senior engineers will work with you to understand your project scope and your talent needs, and they will custom match you with just a few hand-picked candidates. This means that whenever you need to add top-shelf talent for a critical project, you can be connected with pre-screened engineers who are hand-picked for your needs. And the results are impressive. 
TopTal clients conduct just 1.7 interviews for every hire that they make. All you need is to come ready with some decent technical specifications of your project, and TopTal's team of engineers will take care of you from there. If you are looking to add critical talent fast and you need a source you can trust, go to toptal.com slash se daily. You can also send me an email directly at softwareengineeringdaily at gmail.com, and I will personally introduce you to the team at TopTal so that you can learn more. We live in unique times. The nature of work is changing, and more and more industry-leading companies from Airbnb to JP Morgan are realizing the benefits of scaling quickly and staying flexible by working with elite freelancers. So if you're short on resources for your projects, check out toptal.com slash se daily. Thanks to TopTal for sponsoring the show. Now let's get on with this episode. So, so there was this there was this book that Eric Schmidt came out with a while ago uh, called The New Digital Age. And one of the things that he talked about in that book was the idea that giant media organizations are going to be replaced by over time by smaller, uh, smaller, more verticalized organizations. Um, and one of the ways that I think this is playing out in the media landscape is that these broad, um, supposedly objective media organizations like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or so on, you know, insert your giant supposedly objective media organization here is getting is getting broken down and replaced by uh, more tightly vertical, uh, perhaps inherently subjective organizations such as Software Engineering Daily or Code Newbie or, you know, I don't know, something else that's that's mm-hmm. tightly vertical. Do you think there is room for both of these types of organizations? <clears throat> so that's a tough question. I think it depends on what it means to have room, right? Um, for me, when I did journalism and I was at NPR, there was a huge sense of pride in the work that we did. Um, and granted, we didn't get paid very much, especially compared to you know developer salaries. Um, and we worked incredibly, incredibly hard. But there was a huge sense of pride. And it wasn't, you know, the pride wasn't just at being able to work at a place like NPR. It was in the story itself. Um, You know, there were a number of times where I would get very, very relatively small things wrong in my reports, whether it's, you know, confusing a a five for an eight when I was, you know, writing it down or, you know, it's just just really small things. And it would kill me. It would absolutely kill me. And that level of, you know, those details mattered so, so, so much. I remember I did a story on abortion, which ended up being just a huge fiasco. Um, and it was specifically on, uh, abortion and, and kind of targeting minorities, specifically African Americans, uh, and Planned Parenthood's role in, in targeting them and whether or not that was true. And we had two guests, one who was for, one who was opposed. And, you know, I, I personally had no opinions on that topic. So it was pretty easy for me to come in very objective and, you know, I tried to get two different guests who were very, very contrasting in their views and asked balanced questions. And I realized after the fact that there were certain things in the way that I had placed the story and framed the story that ended up being, you know, that ended up looking like we were swaying one way or another. And I didn't mean to at all. Like that was not my intention. Um, so something like saying uh, anti-abortion versus um, you know, uh, pro-life, right? Like that says something about your opinion. And those were like those small little details that I just didn't think about in the moment that I was very upset with myself for after the story aired. And so that level of just caring, right? That level of, um, of passion on making sure you have balanced stories and good sources, that was a huge, huge part of the culture of working at a place like NPR. Does that culture exist at those smaller vertical organizations, right? Does that exist at a place that does not have the many, many years of journalistic authority that the New York Times has? That is probably my biggest, biggest concern. Uh, Whenever I read a blog post or, you know, an article that might be a blog post, I'm still not sure where we draw the line on that. Um, and I look at, you know, what they publish and their stories and the way they're framed. I get very upset. I get very, very upset. I get upset at the lack of research, the lack of sources, the fact that the source is one tweet from 
two years ago from one random person. And that's the backing of this. Like that stuff really pisses me off. Um, typos annoy the crap out of me. If you're, if you have advertisers who are paying to be on your site, you need to not have typos. You need to have commas in all the right places. And so what, you know, when, when we talk about, is there room I think there is because of money and because of businesses. You know, I think that vertical, more niche, smaller publications, I'm going to guess, probably have an easier time getting, you know, ad sales and and working with partners because they're gearing towards a very specific audience and they can speak to that audience a lot better than a more general publication. Um, And so from a business perspective, from a purely financial, you know, opportunity perspective, yes, there's definitely room for smaller ones in terms of what's best for society and what's best for our knowledge and making sure we have good, solid, objective reporting and information. Maybe I'm just a little bit concerned about the quality of information that we'll get over the long term if what ends up happening is bigger institutions ended up end up fading out because they don't know how to make the same amount of money in this current landscape compared to the smaller institutions. Got it. So let's get back to talking about something more relevant to programming, I guess. Um, You work full-time at Microsoft, and um, you manage the Tech Jobs Academy. What is this program? Sure. So it is a 16-week full-time immersive technical training program. So it's a partnership between ourselves, uh, City Tech, which is a community college part of the CUNY system in New York City, and part of the New York City government's Tech Talent Pipeline which is a $10 million initiative to get more people into tech and to get them um, access to these really great opportunities in technology. And so it's a four-month program for our first cohort. We're almost halfway through the program at this point. We chose 25 absolutely incredible people. Um, The program is serving unemployed and underemployed New Yorkers, making less than $50,000 a year. So we're really trying to give an opportunity to people who may not traditionally have access or resources to access the tech industry. So that's what we're doing. Give me more of an idea of what the backgrounds of <clears> the <throat> students in Tech Jobs Academy, what, what what kind of backgrounds do they come from? Sure. It's very, very diverse. Uh, so we have people who are, you know, recently out of school, recently out of college, um, and, you know, got an associate's degree. So for this first cohort, they can't have a four-year degree, but a lot of our students do have some college experience. Uh, we have people who, we have a, a number of parents, actually. We have one student who, who recently had a, his wife had a, a baby and had to kind of like fly down and take care of her and then had to like come back to class and, and keep going with the program. He's a trooper, absolutely incredible guy. Um, and so we've had a number of parents. Uh, we have people who have had exposure to tech, but not been the tech person. Kind of similar to my story where they um, they were in HR working alongside the IT folks and could you know overhear their conversations, but couldn't really be a part of it, things like that. And then we have people who have done some tech work more on you know help desk and that level of support who are really looking to level up and launch a true career in IT. What's the curriculum? Sure. The curriculum is mostly teaching Microsoft technologies. Um, and so it's Windows Server, Active Directory, um, a lot of private cloud stuff, uh, some Azure in there. So uh, one of the things that we've seen with our employer ecosystem who you know leverage Microsoft's products is that they are moving away from strictly on-site server infrastructure and moving to the cloud. So there's some degree of like hybrid Uh, going on there. And so a big part of our focus in the program is teaching the quote unquote traditional system administration stuff, but also learning about the cloud so that as we move towards that, they'll have the skills to be able to speak to that uh, and get jobs in that area. Um, And then we also have two other components. We have a small math component, which is uh, really helpful, you know, just to give some context and make sure people are on the same page. And then we have a soft skills component, which is my part. Um, So a lot of what I do is on technical blogging, uh, which is funny. They were all very, very scared of technical blogging. They had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, and then they wrote some absolutely incredible, very user-friendly, very wonderful tutorials on the things that they're learning. So a lot of it is also writing abilities, speaking abilities, You know, making sure that you can not only do the job, but prove to someone in an interview that you can do the job. So that's the curriculum that we're working with. So we did a show recently with uh, the last mile, which is this program where inmates are learning to code. And uh, one of the things that the guy that we had on, Wes Bailey, he said was that 
when they started creating the program, they assumed too much about what mm-hmm. students knew. And mm-hmm. they actually had to dial back the the types of things that that um, that they were teaching in order to actually um, you know create create a curriculum that was open to to other to to people that really didn't have uh, enough experience. So, ha- have you had any experiences like this where you're like uh, you just take something for granted wh- when you're teaching these these people and and you have to dial it back and teach them something that um, I don't know. Uh, exposes your uh, naivety about the situation. <laughs> Definitely. Um, we've experienced that as a program. When the students walked in, the, the instructor assumed some degree of technical knowledge that we found out wasn't quite there that first week. And so we had to spend some time reviewing some more foundational pieces before they could really dive into the meat of the material. So that's definitely happened. Um, it's happened to me personally, too, because as I said, I teach some of the career development, soft skills part of things, too. Uh, and I assumed that everyone knew what a tech blog was, um, and a lot of them did not. And they thought, you know, when I think of a blog, I'm thinking of, you know, cat pictures on Tumblr and, you know, the idea that you could write basically an article on the web for people to see that had a lot of really rich technical information, which is a totally new concept. Uh, and once I realized that I had to write another little workshop where we dissected a tech blog and we pulled up some examples and we went through literally sentence by sentence what the purpose was and what it did and how we can replicate some of those best practices. So I definitely been guilty of those assumptions. So as you're going through this, um, curriculum development uh i'm sure you're thinking a lot about education and um there's all these different ways that you can learn programming these days there's obviously the traditional computer science curriculum there are these coding boot camps and there are online courses and then there are all kinds of other methodologies um one of the things i we talk about a lot is on on this show is is you know, what is the worth of the computer science degree these days? Um, and obviously, you you know, you haven't been through the computer science curriculum, but judging from your perspective on the landscape, is a computer science degree still worth it? Or, it, you know, has it, has it been subsumed by these alternative education paths? Oh, that's a really good question. I like that one. Um, so, I think that it's still relevant. I think that if you want to work at the absolute top 10 tech companies, I think you probably do, unfortunately, have to have a computer science degree. I know that's changing. Um, So, for example, I know that Google has been doing a lot of work on uh, reaching out to less traditional people, you know, people with less traditional backgrounds in tech and, and not being as strict as it used to be with both having a computer science degree, but also graduating from like a top 10 university, right? And those are the, those are the two things. It's not just as simple as having the degree. It's having the degree from a place that is very prestigious. Um, so I think that we're shifting. I think that that's changing. I don't think it's completely subsumed um, by the boot camps and all that. I think that there are just so many boot camps. There's so many of them. There's online ones or in-person ones. And I get emails all the time from people uh, you know, who are a part of these programs who want to be on the show and want to use it as a way to, yeah. <laughs> I know you get those those emails too, but I get those emails all the time. I don't, um, actually. I get those emails all the time. Sponsored so like, content. Yeah. Right. There you go. <laughs> Buzz, you're, so, the, and, you're the BuzzFeed of podcasts. That's your opportunity. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be the best leader podcast. Um, but yeah, and, and it's it's kind of awkward because, uh, yeah, that's usually when I'll say, you know, we can't have you on the show because we don't want the show to be basically a huge, you know, product placement for your company. But if you want to be a sponsor, uh, you know, we do have those opportunities. So I, I try to find that line. And also the importance of finding that line comes back to having worked at NPR and being a journalist and trying to respect the boundaries, right, between journalism and business like that's a line that I care about and I try to walk and people who may not have that you know that journalism background may not even recognize should be there um side note but um but back to your question about boot camps and and you know new ways of learning I think that because there are so many of them there's a huge range in quality there are ones that are very very good very strong uh and then there are some that are 
not quite there, uh, mostly because it's a really new field. It's a really new thing. Uh, I think boot camps are still maybe six years old, seven years old. It's probably the, the oldest that a boot camp can be at this point. And we just, as an industry, have a lot to learn about what works. You know, there is this assumption that three months to learn a new skill is enough time. Um, and maybe it is for some people, maybe it's not for others. I think that's not a strict of a rule. I think that's something we're still figuring out and we're playing with. What do you learn? Um, how much time do you spend learning Ruby versus Rails? How much time do you spend learning JavaScript versus, you know, other parts of, of the front end? You know, there's so many questions that I don't think we have really good answers to. And I think that until we get better answers and more data points, um, I don't think that, you know, these programs right now at this point are totally taking over the computer science degree. I think that the other thing is because boot camps are so new, a lot of companies just don't know if they are a good resource yet, right? Um, I know a lot of companies who've tried them out think they're an amazing solution and really stand by them, but they're still a relatively new concept, whereas a CS degree is like the standard, right? Mm -hmm. So replacing the standard is going to take a little bit more time. Well, speaking as somebody who has gone through the computer science program and then talked to a bunch of people doing boot camps on the podcast, my impression is that actually these boot camps teach things that the computer science curriculum actually just does not teach at all. Um, mm -hmm. Like much of this stuff that you tackle on your show, the psychological hurdles, the ability to focus on something and the ability to... Um, self-direct, um, this is something that a computer science curriculum at a, at, an, at a university oftentimes will just eschew completely because it is this coddling atmosphere uh, mm. where you are walked through everything. And the boot camp, it's even called a boot camp because they they whip you and they say at the end of three <laughs> weeks or six, six weeks or whatever, we're kicking you out and you're going to have mm -hmm. to be able to fend for yourself. Um, unlike computer science uh, education in universities, which is like, yeah, this is the like this indefinite four to eight year process. You know, you're just a they're just learning throughout it. And anyway, I don't mean to soapbox, but um, I'm personally a, a much bigger fan of the boot camps from a economic perspective than the computer science uh, degree. Mm -hmm. And and that's a really good point because I think the question is, you know, do you learn something that is directly applicable to the job, right? A boot camp does not have time to talk about a lot of the quote unquote fundamental computer science concepts and talk about the history and do, you, know, you have to learn the things that you need to learn to do the job. And it's very, very specific and very tailored to that. And so in terms of, you know, the, the return on investment, right? If your goal is how much money do I need to spend to get a very, you know, a decent job, at least an entry level job in this field, Boot camps are probably a very efficient solution, at least you know conceptually. Um, from so, whenever we have guests on the podcast of of people who have computer science degrees, I always try to ask, you know, was it worth it? You know, now that you've done it, have you? <laughs> you're shaking your head. Um, you know, have you have you learned all the things that you need to learn? And for the most part, the answer has been no. For the most part, most guests say uh, it just wasn't really worth the money and the experience. Um, but I do know that at least a handful of guests have said that it's a good way to have background and context and just have a, a better appreciation for computer science and have that. But it wasn't enough. You know, there wasn't enough directly applicable stuff to get that first job. Yeah, here's here's what here's the thing. Like, here's the myth that these computer science universities uh, rest on. It's that there is this set of fundamental secrets that only the university can bestow upon you. Mm -hmm. That is a myth. Um, the the boot camps can teach you what you need to know, um, and just this idea that oh maybe in the university there's some sort of theoretical secrets. You know maybe the machine learning, the AI, the uh, NLP, um, any other acronyms that are associated <laughs> with higher education, computer science. These are all myths. And um, anyway, uh, they're designed to perpetuate imposter syndrome and get people to attend computer <laughs> science, higher education. So anyway, um, moving beyond my personal gripes with higher education, when you engage with people who uh, are not <clears throat> programmers, but are um, you know, they, they want to understand tech. Um, 
what are the biggest misconceptions that people have about programming and have about technology in the broader world? I think, uh, so a lot of times we'll have, well, we've had a couple of Twitter chats that are on, you know, how do I explain to my family what it is that I do? And those are a lot of fun. We get lots of really fun stories (laughs) out of that, (laughs) out of those Twitter chats. Um, And so one of the big ones is just kind of, they, they really have no sense of what web development is. Um, you know, there, there's no understanding of what the difference is between a website and a web app and how they can be the same thing but aren't necessarily the same thing. You know, the, the concept of like a back end versus a front end, that's totally lost on people. Um, so there's kind of these big categories of things around how, uh, you know, developers work and their tool set and, and, and you know, how they think about technology that is completely lost on people. Um, I think there's also a huge confusion with, you know, being a software developer and learning how to, you know, fix your internet. We get a lot of those. We get a lot of stories of people saying, oh, you're, you're, you're a tech person, right? Okay. Can you tell me why my internet's not working? (laughs) Uh, So, you know, kind of lumping it and, and not really appreciating that there are different specialties. That's probably one of the bigger challenges and misconceptions, um, in the, in the non-tech world. Right. Can you fix my cracked iPhone? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you're in New York. Um, yes. From living in Seattle, I sometimes get the sense that I'm missing out from uh, living in San Francisco where all the action is supposedly happening. What's your impression for how the American tech scene varies from city to city? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm very I'm not a very good New York City developer because I don't generally go to events. Um, and and I I love being here because I like the idea that I could go to events if I wanted to, but I generally have not been very good at leveraging those opportunities. And I think that when I first started in tech back when I was more in the startup world, I went to everything. I went to all the conferences, all the meetups. Every single day I had an event, I was networking, I was meeting people. And I think that once I got a little bit more comfortable and once I got, you know, a little bit more adjusted, I I just didn't do it as much as um, I used to. I do most of my networking, honestly, on Twitter and just online. Um, But I can tell you that for the the tech scene in New York City, there are really two. There's one, which is more of the startup scene, which is the part that I was most familiar with. And the startup scene is, you know, people very much focused on their money, on VCs. How do I become the next Slack, the next Instagram? You know, that was really the focus of the conversation. The guests that were interviewed were hardly ever the CTOs or, you know, any real tech people. It was the business people, the sales people, the marketing, everybody who wasn't actually working on the product. Um, And that, you know, was at that time because I didn't know any better either. You know, I didn't know about tech or coding or any of that. That was very exciting. I thought it was really cool. Um, I really wanted to be a part of that world. And then when I became a developer, there was this whole other side, right? There's this whole other tech community, which is just on developers. And, you know, we focus on the code and the product and we have more product managers and designers and, uh, you know, programmers and CTOs. And the conversations there are just so, so different. The focus is so, so different. The culture is so, so different. And, I feel very lucky that I've been so embedded in both of these cultures that I can kind of compare and contrast. I like the developer one a lot more. (laughs) We are a lot more to the point. um, I think we're a lot more, honestly, a lot more welcoming. I think we're a lot more thoughtful and and we try, you know, we're very aware of our flaws and I, I feel like we are trying to address them when it comes to inclusion, uh, you know, and, and being more diverse and, you know, all that good stuff. And so, I really, really like the developer community a lot here. Um, there's many opportunities to get involved. There's lots of people trying to make it more welcoming to newcomers and beginners. Um, and when I've gone to different cities, it, it's incredible. You know, most of my time is spent in Ruby communities. And when I go to different conferences, you know, in all over the world, everyone is so nice. Like everyone is so freaking nice. And I remember the first conference I went to, I think I wrote a blog post about it. I was really scared because I didn't know what to expect. I'd heard terrible things about the tech industry and, you know, I'm a black woman, so I didn't know how that was going to work out. And, you know, when I got there, everyone was just so incredibly warm and welcoming. And I thought, okay, there's probably just this one conference. Um, but you know, at this point I've I've gone to Australia and, and, and Europe and a bunch of different cities in the U S and, 
the Ruby community has been consistently welcoming and kind and just really, really nice. Um, and so I, I don't know how much that speaks to all of the developer community, but in my experiences, yeah, um, the, I've been very happy the, about The that. blog post you're talking about, I think, is the floodgates of <clears throat> assholery. I read that. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a good one. It's like very you, proud were, of that title. You, were, you went to a conference, you constantly expected the floodgates of assholery to open and to just be, uh, <laughs> you know, to be, I don't know, um, ostracized somehow or criticized, and it just never happened. And it was... Yeah, um, it was weird. Yeah, it was weird, but it's it's a great thing. Um, so your initial goal of learning to program, if I understand correctly, was catalyzed by seeing people make things and get to be true creators, true entrepreneurs. Is this creation process, this entrepreneur entrepreneurship, is this for everyone? No. Oh, my God. No, it is not at all. Um, I think that one of, so one of the first business books I read was the lean startup and in lean startup, it's very product development focused. Um, it's weird. It's like, if you read the book, you know, it's, I'm pretty sure, uh, what's his name? Eric. Eric Ries. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he was the CTO of that company at the time, but it's like hailed as a business book, but I think it's much more of a product development book. And, um, and if you, you read it, it's all about iterating and all about, learning and you try a really small thing, you try out a very small feature, you test it out, you get some results, you tweak and you just keep doing that until you finally find, you know, product market fit. And the thing about that, that I hate is the trying things out and getting data because, you know, in practice, how do you know if your data is good data? Do you have enough data points? Is asking three of your friends enough information? Does it have to be 20 strangers on the internet? What if the way that you found those strangers was all incredibly biased because it was from this one tweet that this one, you know, IT guy tweeted out for you? You know, I mean, there's just, there's so, there's, there's so much ambiguity around how much data and how do you know, and the data is never black and white, even if you do have a good data set. And just that whole process is just very, very frustrating and annoying. Uh, and I think that for a lot of people who've attempted to, you know, do that model and do product development, quote unquote, the right way, that's been a huge pain point of figuring out how to do that. I think that's very different from what we talk about in the developer community, where it's more about honing in on your craft and, you know, having best practices and making sure your code is very clean. And, you know, that that side of things is just, it's different, right? That one is, it, the goal is almost attaining perfection to a degree, right? It's it's making something that's beautiful, that's you're very proud of, it is artistic. And that's a very different thing from iterating and failing and failing and failing until you finally get it right. Um, I don't like the failing and failing until you get it right. I like the crafts part of things. Mm. Um, and I didn't realize that that was such a big part of being a programmer or at least the culture of being a programmer until I did it but I'm really glad that it exists yeah okay so I want to begin to close off um you've been very gracious with your time the code newbie podcast and community and twitter chat it's very impressive um what is in the future for code newbie Oh, you want secrets? Okay, I'll give you some secrets. Um, so one thing that we're currently are you working- developing your own operating system? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's called a code to BOS. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so a couple things we started late last year, we started doing some in-person meetups because everyone kept requesting it and I was holding off for a very long time. And then finally I broke down. Um, so we have three and we're launching our fourth one this Friday. So we have one in Austin, Atlanta, Philly, and we're launching one in Dallas. Um, and we have plans to launch a couple more in Nashville and DC and Indianapolis. So this year we're going to be really pushing the in-person meetup stuff. Um, we're looking for, you know, leaders and people to help us build the community and reach an entirely new audience. When we started doing it on meetup.com, I was very, very surprised. I actually flew down to Austin, which was our first one to, you know, be there for the first meetup and support and meet people. And we had about, I think like 20 people come out for, um, you know, went to a restaurant and had drinks and, you know, hung out and got to know each other. And I was so, so shocked that no one at the table had actually heard of Code Newbie and didn't know that it was a thing. They only heard about Code Newbie on meetup.com. Like they thought the Austin one was the only like Code Newbie thing. Wow. And what that's and that's been consistent for a lot of the meetups that we have. And what that really told me was, huh, meetup.com is a great channel to reach people who just aren't on Twitter, you know, as much as I am and aren't 
you know, don't do the online stuff as much as I would. Uh, and so it's been a really great way to reach more people and, and help more people learn to code. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot more meetups. Uh, we're working on having the Code Newbie Conference, which I'm really excited about. So we're shooting for some time in either October, November, or fall. Uh, we're currently picking a location for it, but it's most likely going to be in Atlanta. Um, and so really, really excited about that. And, you know, my goal is just to keep going, you know, to keep doing the podcast and keep finding more guests and, and keep telling these stories. Okay, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's plenty of stuff I could have gotten to that I want to discuss, <laughs> um, but uh, I will let you get on with your Saturday. Um if you ever have anything else you want to discuss, feel free to come on the show. Uh, Saron, <laughs> Deal. Saron, uh, pronounce your name correctly. Thank you <laughs> for coming on the show. This has been awesome. I'm a big fan of your podcast, and I'm a huge fan of the message of Code Newbie. So thank oh, you thank so you. much. And let me know if I can uh, ever help in any way from one podcaster to another. So <laughs> um, it was a real pleasure having you on. Awesome. It was great being on the show. You asked really good questions. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. They they would be better questions on a weekday, probably. (laughs) A little little out of my element with the weekend (laughs) weekend episode. Anyway, cool. Thanks. Thank you so much. No problem. 